Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You, a brand new concept for the BBC, a show which isn't a repeat. Unless, of course, you're watching the repeat, in which case it's business as usual. In the news this week, at the site of the proposed Chislehurst bypass, tunnel protesters get off to a bad start as Swampy takes a wrong turning. <laughs> Despite the recent floods in Venice, normal service continues at the Café del Marco. <laughs> and producers at Animal Hospital regret asking a three-year-old to mend a sparrow's broken wing. <laughs> On Ian Hislop's team, an MP who's responded to claims that he'll be the next leader of the Lib Dems with the words, I would not rule anything out or anything in. So the party's traditional policy seems safe in his hands. <laughs> Charles Kennedy. <laughs> and with Paul Merton tonight, a musician once referred to by The Guardian as the Gary Glitter of jazz, a purely musical reference. <laughs> Something their lawyers asked us to point out. <laughs> George Malley. <laughs> round one normally acts as the point of departure for most viewers. Paul and George, <coughs> don't be vague. Oh yes, um, this is the, uh, the House of Parliament and the House of Lords. Also there's William Haig uh, here, in, here in the good news. That's Lord uh, Cranbourne, Cranbourne. I think we'll say Cranbourne given that it's his name. <laughs> You started early. <laughs> Nicely to start at all. I think, um, is it about William Haig and the House of Lords and Lord Cranbourne and a Spaniel? Uh, <laughs> and where does the Spaniel fit in? Well, it's a quote from Lord Cranbourne. He used a sort of hunting quote. He said, I was like a Spaniel that was let off the loose or something. An ill-trained Spaniel, yes. He also said Haig was right to sack me. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you wonder why they want to abolish the House of Lords. <laughs> Cranbourne negotiated a deal, which Haig has now accepted. Yeah, so well, that's a sacking offence, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Disgraceful disloyalty. He um, went behind his leader's back and indeed over his head. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he must be a fit man. <laughs> so, how long have the Cranbourne family been around in the House of Lords? 3,000 years. <laughs> the first Lord Cranbourne was Lord Cranbourne of Stonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've no that idea. That was when Stonehenge was an up-and-coming area. <laughs> <laughs> and what have Labour said about all this? <laughs> 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 and what have the Lib Dems said? Any idea, Charles? We're still considering our position. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you agreed with Tony? Isn't that the basic line? Uh, well... <laughs> They're very cosy, aren't they, those two? <laughs> what are you suggesting, Mr. Yeah. Melly? Uh, Just because we're both wearing green. Hunting green, it's a spaniel thing. Yeah. <laughs> Damn boy. Is, um... <laughs> yes, this is the sudden revelation at Prime Minister's Question Time that uh, Conservative Lord Cranbourne had uh, done a deal with Tony Blair without telling his leader, William Hague. Uh, somewhat obliquely, Lord Cranbourne said, I have been sacked for running in like an ill-trained spaniel, which, according to the Mail, is a shooting term which refers to a poorly trained but eager gun dog. According to the Mirror, is a reference to hunting hounds that disobey their master, and according to the Sun, refers to a dog being punished for coming into its owner's house from outside and weeing on the car. <laughs> uh, Ian and Charles, bombs away. Ah, this is a Europe story. It's a man called Oscar. That's the British King. flag. <laughs> In two years' time. Yeah. British currency. Yep. This is about Europe and mm. taxation and the British veto and all of that. And there's a bit of a row this week, but unfortunately it was overshadowed by Lord Cranbourne. Because mm. the government was actually in trouble in Europe this week. And for the first time in about five years, the Tories had an open goal in Europe. So they self-destructed. <laughs> so who are the major players in this spat? Oscar Lafontaine. Mm -hmm. Oscar is the finance minister for Germany, mm -hmm. who wants taxes all over the place harmonised, in a single currency. Basically the Sun said, this is the most dangerous man in Europe. In what language did they say that? Um, they said in German, didn't mm, they? Yes, there we are. That's Der Sun. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a problem uh, with this particular page, in fact. What, no Sun readers can read any of it? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. The sun doesn't translate as the sun in German, it's something else. Uh, yes, the reason for that is because the translator's train was late, and so it had to be translated by a couple of uh, hacks <laughs> at the sun who didn't speak German. <laughs> I'm um, surprised it didn't say Der Spitfire Kummen Handy Hock England. <laughs> does, uh, does Oscar appear inside, stripped to the waist? <laughs> Sadly not. Um, not fantasising God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is uh, the campaign against uh, German finance minister Oscar Lafontaine, who wants to remove Britain's right to decide on its own taxes. Uh, the campaign has been led by The Sun, uh, which said this week, The Sun is not anti-German, this is too serious an issue for gung-ho phrases <laughs> harking back to the war. <laughs> uh, later adding, uh, we will fight, fight, fight... <laughs> This is the biggest threat to the British way of life since 1945. And listen very carefully, Herr Lafontaine, we will say this only once. Their uh, knowledge of World War II seemingly based on BBC sitcoms. Paul and George, Exhibit A. Oh, yes. The Turner Prize. Mm -hmm. One of the runners-up. Uh, here's the winner. This is the first time <laughs> for some time that paint has actually been involved with the winner of the tournament. <laughs> and there he is, he comes to Manchester, uh, where it's as far awfully. as one knows, there's quite a shortage of elephant shit. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Man City play recently? <laughs> well, I do think his mm. work is decorative, pleasant, lovely surface and all that. I don't find it enormously profound, let's say, despite the lumps of dust. What does it smell like? <laughs> it's quite a pleasant smell, like most vegetable eaters, the elephant, you know. I mean, if you'd chosen to use humans, <laughs> <laughs> elephants fine, like horses, you know, they mm. smell quite nice. Mm. Quite nice. <laughs> How yes. did you get it onto the palate? <laughs> just go sort of like that. Yeah. No, because they're very well modelled, if you notice. There's not oh, a are splosh they? at all. Oh, right. It's like a sort of uh, a hamburger. It's like something... <laughs> I don't think you can get away with saying it was something like McDonald's. <laughs> Legally. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so it is this year's Turner Prize, which was uh, won by Chris Offaly with his uh, paintings made of elephant dung. One of Mr. Offaly's uh, elephant dung designs was bought by self-styled modern art guru Charles Saatchi, so it's gone straight from one enormous arsehole to another. <laughs> and uh, finally, Ian and Charles. Uh, this is the BBC, remember? <laughs> uh. Michael Martin Doyle, journalist. Ah, uh, there's William Hague with his supporter. Yeah. <laughs> this is Mr. Yes. Mandelson, and he was on a visit to Rio, and the magazine made various allegations, which that which, other uh, man called Martin Doyle strongly refuted. What I don't understand about this piece of film is why William Hague and his lovely wife Fionn then appear at the end. Ah. But the only thing I can tell you is what a Labour MP told me a while back. Why are there two Fs in Fionn? Because there's no F in leader. <laughs> and so, Ian is not allowing me to publicise the publication that printed these unsubstantiated allegations. No, Do you feel free to mention it? No, you would punch me. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, alleged in Punch magazine. Uh, it's a magazine owned by Mohammed Al Fayed. It's always a laugh when they accuse someone else of wrongdoing. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So why was Haig there? I haven't got a clue why he was. Well, that's Haig with his Hill characteristic Carving. brilliant judgment made a joke. Mm. Oh, of course, yeah. I forgot about that. He said it was Lord Mandelson of Rio in one of his amusing knockabout speeches, <laughs> which then backfired immediately, <laughs> <laughs> like nearly everything else he did. He did so, explain himself. He said it was a little bit of light entertainment. <laughs> so watch out for William's house party. <laughs> <laughs> And there was another person implicated in the allegations. Well, Martin Dow lives with a person called Fabrizio Fabriano, I believe. And Mandelson stayed with them while he was on his visit to Rio. That much of the story appears to be true. The rest of it appears not to be true. I mean, Fayed basically goes around trying to find stuff about government ministers in order to blackmail them. 
um, into giving him a passport. <laughs> I hope the lawyers are getting all this. <laughs> now, George, you once described yourself as 15% gay, didn't you? It's a pretty low average, I would have thought, looking at the present government. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I used to be entirely gay, and uh, I gradually drifted. <laughs> uh, yes, only 15% left. I'm right. that very inactive. The odd leer. <laughs> the odd leer at a waiter. <laughs> I loved your description of the, of the difference between homosexuality and heterosexuality. You said you preferred heterosexuality because at least you could see the person's face. <laughs> uh, yes, this is uh, this week's denial of, uh, of allegations that uh, Peter Manson visited notorious gay nightclubs in Rio uh, whilst on a ministerial trip, uh, as maintained in an article uh, in Punch magazine. Uh, people were shocked by an amazing revelation that Punch was still going. <laughs> According to Punch, uh, Mandelson visited a certain nightclub frequented by con men who win your trust, lull you with false promises and then take all your money. A practice known in Brazil as Goodnight Cinderella, or in this country as Voting New Labour. <laughs> Uh, which uh, meddlesome behaviour uh, marked the end of this uh, interference with uh, Paul and George uh, protesting too much, trailing as they are, 5-4. There's nothing like the welcome return of an old favourite, or indeed the rather irritating return of our tabloid headline round. Paul and George, your tricky spinner is, check out the difference between men and women. It's to do with stress over shopping, isn't it? I get terribly stressed if I have to shop. The very words Harvey Nichols makes me faint. <laughs> and on the other hand, old my wife sees the back George. <laughs> I don't know any man, straight or gay, who actually likes shopping. You like I shopping, like do shopping, you? Yeah. Oh, are you straight or gay? <laughs> Can you see the face? <laughs> yeah. You can if you're looking in the mirror. <laughs> So you'll be shopping for toys this Christmas. Do you know what the top of the list at the moment? Top ten? Furbies. Yep. Which are? They're like Fergies, except less irritating. <laughs> <laughs> they burp, break wind and talk nonsense, apparently. Do you get a fee for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is uh, the finding by medical researchers that uh, men shopping with their partners suffer from increased levels of stress. Uh, when first shown the survey's findings, the male shoppers said, Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice too. Can we go now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ian and Charles, Blair and condoms, but no Braveheart. Oh, I think I know what this may be about. Labour have just got humiliated in the north of Scotland in a European by-election. They came third, and the Nationalists won it, hence the Braveheart reference. Mm. Who was second? The Conservatives were second. So that makes you lot... Now, just to move on... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it isn't, actually. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Is this about Scottish television news and BBC? In what way? In what way? I'm in a loop of time here, aren't I? <laughs> Why don't you put us out of your misery? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the opening of the new Scottish Museum. Oh, that. Oh, uh, that. The Queen story. opened that, yeah. Various celebrities were asked to suggest things yeah. that. Right. symbolise life in Scotland in the 20th century. Tony Blair was one of the people who was asked, and uh, he suggested a guitar. guitar. Mm. A guitar. He's always suggesting a guitar. <laughs> it was a guitar when he did it, Desert Island Discs, and it was a guitar for this and a guitar for that. You think, God almighty, man, you're the Prime Minister. You're not thinking of something else than a bloody guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but it shows he's young and groovy and in touch. Rock and roll, the shadows, Cliff Richard. <laughs> Yes. 
Sean Connery, a former milkman, suggested a glass milk bottle. He used to do a milk round in Edinburgh, where people still remember his milk float as the only one equipped with machine guns and ejector seats and capable of reaching a speed of almost 12 miles an hour. <laughs> Which jiggery pokery brings us reeling to the end of this particular fling, with uh, Paul and George uh, taking the high road, leading as they do 6 5. Ooh. And so uh, to the simple, if generally bungled, task of picking an odd one out. Uh, Paul, your mm -hmm. uh, shiny happy people are Bruce Forsyth, yes. Russ Abbott, mm -hmm. the Duchess of York, mm -hmm. and General Pinochet. <laughs> Well, this is game shows, isn't it? They've all hosted game shows apart from um, Sarah Ferguson. <laughs> Just uh, run us through the Oof. General Pinochet game show again. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the generation game. You had to guess which member of your family wasn't coming home that night. <laughs> No, I, well, it, it's, it's because he's just moved to Wentworth, isn't it? Where, um, on the back and onto the golf course, where, where Bruce and, um, and Russ um, mm. live. And uh, Sarah Ferguson lived there. She doesn't live there anymore. They live there. He's renting somewhere. She's the odd <laughs> one out because she doesn't live there, and they do. Is the right answer. Yeah, right. <laughs> General Pinochet's new residence in Wentworth will cost £10,000 a month to rent. In addition, the owner has insisted that insurance be taken out against bomb, rocket or firearm damage, presumably in case the general's in one of his moods. <laughs> uh, up until his arrest, General Pinochet had been very fond of Britain and had been a regular visitor. England is my favourite country because of its civility, moderation and respect, said the bloated old mass-murdering bastard. <laughs> George, Carol Vorderman, Sylvester Stallone, Albert Einstein, and Gary Bushell. I think they're probably all members of Mensa, except for Einstein. It's close to the right answer. Thank it's you Gary Bushell. The only reason I didn't think Einstein was, mm. was I didn't know if Mensa existed when he was alive. And also, was he intelligent enough? Well, that's even more in the right area. Oh, well, you say, so it's not Gary Bushell's the only one who models immersion heaters. <laughs> <laughs> he had a lower intelligence. Yeah, exactly They've right. all got over 145 yes. or something, mm, those yeah. three. He had a lower intelligence quota when he yeah. did those horrible tests. Mm. Yes. Yes. Uh, so all of them have uh, IQs higher than Einstein, apart from Einstein. <clears throat> um, <laughs> which you don't have to be Einstein to work out, really. <laughs> Uh, Sly Stallone uh, has an IQ of 160. He recently said that 17 of his 30 movies made him look stupid. So, high IQ, but he still can't count. <laughs> uh, Gary Bushell boasts an IQ of 156 and recently claimed that Eureka Johnson was the sexiest woman on TV, saying she is untouchable. No doubt the feeling's mutual. <laughs> uh, Ian, Christopher Robin, mm. and Michael Jackson, uh, Richard Branson, and Sir Peregrine Worsthorne former editor of the Sunday Telegraph. Yes, and former um, school friend of George Melly's. This is a school question. The link between me, uh, Peregrine Worsthorne, and Stowe. Michael Jackson's put his son down for Stowe. Worsthorne was at Stowe, and so was um, Branson, and I suppose Christopher Robin, who was real. He was A.A. Milne's son. So they all went there, except Michael Jackson, who's sending his son there. Is a perfect answer. Well, um, Thank you. But uh, George's was rather more interesting. So, George, um, <laughs> so what exactly happened? Um, Nothing. Right. Because <laughs> he claims, of course. He that, claims. Uh, you suggested. In a him book at on school. the public schools, in which he wrote a chapter in which he said, I had a perfectly miserable time at Stowe. I had a rather good time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said that I seduced him expertly. Expertly, I like. Mm. <laughs> On the art school couch. Eventually, a, a review came out, I think by Robert Morley, saying, I shall never speak to George Bailey again, seducing poor little Peregrine. So I wrote, pointing out he was three years older than me. Now, this didn't rule me out seducing him, but I wouldn't have had the nerve, really. Although, I would plead guilty to uh, Congress with many Stoics at the time. Peregrine? No. <laughs> Uh, 
stoic. Is that the word for someone who goes yes. to stow, then? Right. And what's the school motto? Per stow et price stow. Which is? Don't tie your shoelaces up in the playground. <laughs> Peregrine Wersthorn caused a sensation in the 70s when on live television he remarked that no one gave a fuck about certain rumours involving an MP's love life. Of course, that was in the rather old-fashioned days when a bleep covered the F word, whereas now it covers the MP's name. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally in this round, Charles Paddy Ashdown, uh -huh. John Prescott, mm -hmm. a bowler hat and the Thai football team. <laughs> oh. God, this is Mission Impossible. Um, God, they've all been on it. Mm. <laughs> is John Prescott the only one who's auditioned for Doctor Strange, love? <laughs> I am absolutely at a loss. It's jumping out of an aeroplane, isn't it? Parachuting out of a plane. In what way? <laughs> well, is it or isn't it? No, it isn't. No. Well, I won't bother them. No. That breath I saved then will serve me useful in, in you know, yeah. later life. When I'm about 70 odd, I'll just go, done. and that'll be the breath I could have wasted. Well, I've wasted it now, by explaining it. Not bang. Ah. Uh, Do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? In not bang. <laughs> the only thing I can claw my way toward, but I don't think it's this either. Paddy speaks Mandarin. I don't know if they speak Mandarin or some such in Thailand. John Prescott sounds as if he speaks Mandarin. <laughs> and the bowler and hat, hat presumably doesn't speak any language at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's an inspired guess. Right. Uh, uh, it's right, I'll shoot myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's round three. You know um, it's round three, but that's a clue. Boxing. Oh, Prescott used to box. Did, I didn't um, may well have boxed. A and maybe tie... the Thai people box. box. <laughs> and the bowler hat doesn't box. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give you one because you've got the, the right area but not the right um, one out. The answer is that they are all boxers, or have been, uh, except the Thai football team, uh, who are footballers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just... Well, John Prescott used to box, Paddy Ashton used to box, right. and the bowler... He's uh, called a boxer. ...in Australia. Yeah. So, yes, they're all boxers, or have been, apart from the Thai football team, who are footballers, uh, although, as this clip shows from their recent match against Qatar, they occasionally get confused. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> it's like that old joke, I went to a fight and a football match broke out. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Uh, last week, uh, Paddy Ashdown attacked the Queen's speech, saying, This Queen's speech kicks so much off the field that after it there will be standing room only in the long grass. Time for Mr Ashdown's medication, I think. <laughs> Are you going to take him on in the leadership contest, then? No, no, no. <laughs> Ian, I'm very glad you asked me that question. <laughs> you, know, you always know when politicians don't want to answer a question, because they always respond with a question, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so would you like me to uh, carry on? Yeah. Yes, please, right. please. So are you going to challenge him for the... Okay, which, which display of ungentlemanly yeah, thank conduct... You. Which display of ungentlemanly conduct brings round three to... <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> That's magic! That's magic! How did, you, how did you know that Angus was going to say that? He's prophetic. They've only two points behind, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Uh, yes, that's what I was just about to say. In fact, uh, Paul and George beating Ian and Charles at this stage, 10-8. Mm. And so to the unlikely pleasure of our final missing words round, our usual swathe of hand-plucked headlines interspersed with one or fewer from this week's guest publication, the never less than exciting Laundry and Cleaning Today. <laughs> Uh, yours for £3.50, or £5 if you want it today. <laughs> so, let's up an atom with... What isn't too good, says My Prescott. grammar, or grammar my, I think he said. <laughs> yeah. My Queen's English. Yeah. There's a reference to people being snobbish about my the My Queen's German. <laughs> Do 
Yes, my grammar is the right answer. According to uh, John Prescott, if you don't get your words grammatically right, which I don't, there's a bit of looking down your nose. Job on the sun beckoning. <laughs> uh, next, what flies off without warning? Clinton's. <laughs> Un unpaid trouser maker, cuts, flies off without warning. No. Is not Superman. Right <laughs> Spider scares. It's some something they've. <laughs> Spider scares flies off without. I've done three different versions of flies. Uh, no, this is in fact a, a helicopter intellect uh, belonging to former Barclays chief uh, Martin Taylor. <laughs> Next up. My Jimmy Hill Spud is what? Keeping me awake at night. <laughs> Always wrong. No, given that this is the sun, uh, remember, and it's about a potato and a sports reporter. Is a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> My Jimmy Hill Spud is a commentator. Oh. Oh. This is the story of a greengrocer's potato's similarity to Jimmy Hill's face, and we can see it now. <laughs> Uh, next, the importance of what? Oscar. New laundry, cleaning, washing machines, but everything's very nice and soapy. <laughs> Selecting the right program. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you said that with a conviction. No, if that's right, you would deserve an extra point. It's laundry stain removal. Oh. Ah, ah yes. no. I was nearly onto that. Yeah, I was so thinking of the word skid mark. And lastly, what, to atone for sins, says Pope? Indulgences. By indulgences. The Catholic Church is going back to the Middle Ages. No. It's no. actually an instruction. Do something to atone for sins, says Pope. Kneel. Face east. Uh, Help old lady. <laughs> Attend mass. Face ache. Attend mass. Uh, notice, in fact, quit smoking. Uh, so, God knows what his cardinals will do after sex now. <laughs> You're a bit of a smoker, I gather. Is that right? Yes, that's what we do, actually. Right, have you tried giving up? Yep. So you did, and then failed. Right. <laughs> it's a good liberal Democrat <laughs> approach to <laughs> uh, Which, uh, desperate scrabble, means at the end of tonight's charade, uh, this well, week's Fergies was. are Ian and Charles with ten, whilst this week's Furbies Thank are you. Paul and George with eleven. All right. And I leave you with news from abroad as Prince Andrew tries to laugh off a long-forgotten incident involving Miss Samoa and a kumquat. <laughs> uh, word spreads that Peter Mandelson has trapped his fingers in a car door. <laughs> and at the Grammy Awards in LA, there's a rare public appearance by the millionaire songwriter who wrote Smack My Bitch Up. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>